So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Brookings webinar. It's titled Supporting Regional Public Universities to Promote Recovery in the Great Lakes Region. So welcome to this presentation of the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program on the report of the uh, importance of regional public universities through Great Lakes. Uh, I'm Deva Dada. I'm the Chancellor of University of Michigan Flint. It's one of the several regional public universities in the Great Lakes states. As you all know, uh, Flint has faced many difficulties over the years. Um, most notably, the exodus of the auto industry and following that, the population decline, economic decline, and more recently, the, the water crisis. Um, all of these events have impacted our campus like it has impacted the community. But at the same time, it gave us opportunity to engage deeper and help the community through research, resources, and access to education. Now, in the era of COVID-19, um, we are dealing with an unprecedented pandemic, one that none of us have ever experienced. Campuses look very different than they did a year ago, and the college experience, I'm sure, will feel very different this coming fall than it did a year ago, and likely maybe in the foreseeable future. We are experiencing a dramatic economic downturn with unemployment at a historic high. The virus continues to spread without a vaccine or treatment in the horizon or on the horizon. Uh, it's at this time that the RPUs, the regional public universities, can make a significant difference in the regions that they serve. During this turmoil, RPUs have stood as beacons in communities offering ways for people to rebuild their lives through education. That's what we do. Through the years, U of M Flint, along with local and state government and community partners from many sectors, have found ways to work together, solve problems, and bring opportunities to the citizens in the region. U of M Flint has been and will continue to be at the center of these conversations. We are fortunate in Flint to have strong partnerships with the city, with philanthropic institutions like the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, and our fellow educational partners, the Mott Community College and Kettering University. For U of M Flint, these partnerships are key for how we help ensure the future of the region. All of us who work in these universities or live in the communities with the local RPU know the value of these campuses. And I'm referring to all the RPUs now. They are the public square, if you will, the meeting place for promise and progress through an exchange of knowledge, ideas, and scholarship, as this afternoon event is going to demonstrate. The work in this report offers all of us important insights into the role of RPUs, the challenges that we face, and the future role of regional public universities in the current and post COVID-19 era. I'd like to thank the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, and here at the U of M Flint, the Office of University Outreach Staff for making this webinar possible. Let's listen, learn, and get to work for the sake of our communities and the Great Lake region. Looking forward to an excellent conversation. Thank you. Let me now hand it over or invite Rob Maxim and Mark Monroe of Brookings to take over. Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Chancellor Dutta. And, and thank, thank you to your, uh, your good University of Michigan Flint uh, team for helping us put, pull this together. Uh, been kind of a uh, labor of love. Uh, I think we uh, really, really have found this uh, critical work. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody um, and, and thank you for this conversation. So I'm Mark Miro, uh, Senior Fellow at the Metropolitan Policy Program, and I'm delighted to kick the discussion off just by saying a little uh, about why we at uh, uh, Brookings care so much about the status of the regional public. Uh, universities, especially those in the Great Lakes. 
uh, regional public universities, public, four-year, community-oriented universities tend to be overshadowed, we should say, overshadowed by their state's bigger research institutions are the kind of place, uh, 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 the kind of place-based institutions that we care about so much at Brookings uh, and, and uh, have for, for years of our work. They're the kind of place-based institutions that are important because they provide accessible, general purpose, workforce uh, education. These schools are engines of economic inclusion. Uh, but beyond that, at a moment of pandemic, recession, and revealed structural racism, we're also interested in these universities because they sit right at the middle of the many forms of unevenness that are stressing our country right now uh, and its regions. Our work at Brookings in recent years has been intensely uh, focused uh, on the nation sharpening regional and socioeconomic divides. The one leads to the other. The socioeconomic divides lead to uh, regional divides and vice versa. In recent years, we've been tracking the often tough situation of smaller, uh, less elite communities in the Midwest, given the intensification of winner take most dynamics in the economy uh, and, and globalization. Likewise, uh, we've chronicled the intolerable educational and income deficits of Black, Latino, and uh, Native American students who are still uh, unrepresented among uh, the, uh, the bachelor's degree recipients in our country. And given that, we've been privileged to work with our friends at the Joyce Foundation to look closely at the status, importance, potential of the regional public uh, university, because in many ways, they're the kind of institutions that are holding many American communities together in a very real way right now. And they're offering a needed route to upward mobility to people who might not always get it. Just what uh, we're all here to talk about this afternoon. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is have my colleague, Rob Maxim, uh, uh, quickly review the main uh, findings of our brand new report available at Brookings uh, EDU slash Metro. After that, we'll hear a few words from Neil Hegarty of the Mott Foundation, which has uh, generously supported this public meeting. Uh, and then we'll get into the panel discussion, which we led by Samir Gadkari of the Joyce Foundation. And then, of course, we'll open it up to audience uh, participation. Uh, so with that, I'd like to hand uh, this over to my colleague uh, and friend, Rob Maxim, research associate at the Brookings Metro program. And we'll go from there, Rob. Hey, thanks so much, Mark. And I'm just gonna quickly share my screen here so folks can see it. And there we go. And thank you all to the folks who have joined today to discuss this important group of universities and why we need to make sure that they're protected. I'm gonna take you through several of the high level findings of our report. Now this certainly isn't a uh, comprehensive look at everything we found, but it should help level set for the fantastic panel that we have planned shortly. As Mark noted, we looked at four-year regional public universities in this report. One of the reasons we did so is because these schools have a reach that goes well beyond just the flagship and big research one universities that are really the, the most well-known among the public university set. The nation's 440 regional public universities are located in 49 states, every state except for Wyoming and Washington, D.C. In the Great Lakes region, which has 69 regional public universities, and really the Midwest more broadly, have among the highest concentration of these schools anywhere in the country. Among the many reasons to care about regional public universities is that they help support community growth. Looking at the last downturn and the subsequent recovery, we saw that places with a regional public university had smaller declines in employment, and quicker job recovery than places without a university. That's perhaps unsurprising as universities serve as direct employers themselves and generate a variety of indirect and induced employment. And while places with a flagship or public R1 fared the best in the last recovery, we certainly think that regional public universities could have an even stronger economic impact if they received more robust state and federal investments. Regional public universities are also associated with a variety of other positive economic uh, benefits, including higher per capita income 
and higher education levels in the local workforce surrounding these universities. I'll also note that these schools have disproportionate numbers of graduates that fill key community roles. For example, one of the largest major groups of, uh, one of the largest major groups at regional public universities is health fields, which are particularly important given the current pandemic challenges that we face. Education is another of the largest major fields, and that reflects many of these schools' historical roles as teacher colleges. Graduates of regional public universities are often found throughout local government ranks as well. So they really support communities in a variety of ways. And when you look at the numbers, um, again, keeping in mind that we're, we're in the midst of a, a pandemic and we are in the midst of facing a variety of challenges around educational equity in general, um, health majors are an eight percentage point higher share of all graduates at regional public universities than at flagship and public R1 schools and education majors are four percentage points higher. In addition to supporting regional and community development, we also find that Great Lakes uh, regional public universities are important drivers of educational equity, both across racial and economic lines. We find that Great Lakes regional public universities disproportionately serve Black and Native American students, and regional public universities award over twice as many degrees to black students as flagships and public R1s in the Great Lakes region. And they award over three times as many degrees to Native American students as their flagship and R1 counterparts. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't still inequities. Uh, indeed, we find that there's still more that needs to be done to advance educational equity across the region. For example, Black and Hispanic enrollment and attainment numbers lag those groups' share of regional population. And at the same time, Native Americans count, account for less than one half of 1% of all degrees issued by regional public universities, or indeed all public universities in the Great Lakes. So doing more to serve tribal communities should be a commitment for all of higher ed moving forward. And as you can see on the right, regional public universities also serve more Pell Grant recipients than flagships and R1s. This is helped by their lower overall tuition costs, but also reflects their commitment to open access. You know, relatedly, there's, there's evidence from Harvard economist Raj Chetty showing that regional public universities are important resources for promoting upward economic mobility across generations in the US. But while regional public universities have a variety of benefits for students and communities alike, they're facing significant and growing challenges. First is just the demographic question. Enrollment at Great Lakes Regional Public Universities declined 10% from 2011 to 2018, driven by a combination of an improving economy and stagnant, uh, in, 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 uh, stagnant demographics in the region. Particularly over the second half of the last decade, you saw a divergence between flagships and public R1s in the region and regional public universities. Flagships were able to, to grow their enrollment by admitting more out-of-state and international students, an option that regional public universities largely didn't have. And while enrollment typically increases during economic downturns, the unique nature of the COVID-19 pandemic and the reality that some campuses may not be open in the fall means that this crisis, unlike past economic downturns, may not lead to a boost in enrollment for these schools. And even as enrollment declined, states disinvested in the Great Lakes region, in Great Lakes regional public universities. Most states were only just recovering to their pre-recession appropriations levels over the past year or two. Now, with COVID-19 set to wreak havoc on state budgets, it's likely going to deal a significant blow to higher educational appropriations across the region. And at the same time, schools in some states, such as Wisconsin, which has disinvested in higher education over the past decade, or Illinois, which has, has been significantly impacted by its pension and budget crises of the past few years, may face even more acute challenges. All of which brings us to our recommendations for supporting these schools. Our first set of recommendations is simply to stabilize these schools by helping to maintain their appropriations amid what will be several years of state budget damage. 
We recommend an emergency federal fund to support higher education appropriations, as well as coupling that with dedicated funding to support schools that have students with additional educational needs, such as childcare or transportation. You, like that, you likewise see with uh, regional public universities that they admit significantly higher share of uh, first-generation students um, who, who often require additional support, such as uh, non-academic uh, networking or career counseling. From there, we think policymakers need, policymakers need to think about the long run. One way to do so would be to create a new land-grant style program for regional public universities. We recommend structuring it similarly to the land-grant 1994 program, which provided a federal endowment on behalf of tribal colleges and universities. Many regional public universities have little in the way of endowment. A federal endowment on behalf of these schools which you know, could come with conditions around maintaining state support for regional public universities or other you know, inducements to bring states along, could help close the gap between these schools and their flagship and public R1 counterparts. We also think new research funding streams, perhaps with a focus on community-oriented research to reflect these schools' historical missions, would go a long way toward bolstering their economic and community impacts. And given the very real demographic challenges in the Great Lakes region, we think policymakers should also help to encourage greater enrollment by non-traditional students. In other words, those outside of the 18 to 22 year old first time enrollee cohort. Policymakers could provide schools with more funding to specifically target these students and to pilot new forms of experiential learning. For their part, many schools are already making high demand classes more accessible to working professionals and we think it's important to see more of these types of efforts. Finally, regional public university administrators, policymakers, and the general public suffer from a lack of information about these schools. For example, uh, the, in some schools, as many as 40% of students aren't captured by the Department of Education's main database iPads because they're not first-time full-time students. This makes it difficult for policymakers to make informed decisions around things like performance funding or even emergency coronavirus relief. To rectify these data shortcomings, we think Congress should overturn its 2008 ban on creating a federal student unit record, or in the absence of federal action, we think a regional student unit record shared among Great Lakes states could help improve information flow in the region. So we have a, an ambitious policy agenda, but we think in a time of crisis, that calls for significant action. You know, we've seen over $4 trillion in new spending come out of Congress in the past three months. Taking these steps that we outline would do a lot to support regional public universities, as well as the communities and students that they serve. So with that, I will turn it back to Mark just to offer a few couple additional thoughts. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Very, very helpful. I hope, uh, I know we're going to have a rich conversation about that. So uh, with, with that, I'd just like to invite our good friend, uh, Neil Hagerty, uh, the president of programs at the Mott Foundation, uh, a long time, long term friend of the Metro program, uh, to make a few remarks and tee up uh, our, I think, provide really uh, important panel. Thanks, yeah, great. Thanks. Um, thanks so much, Mark and Rob, uh, for that great presentation. Um, outstanding, as always, uh, the work you do at Brookings. And it seems to me as I was listening that this work is more important now than, than ever as the universities cope with the impacts and the recovery from the COVID crisis. And uh, as Dr. Dutta mentioned at the outset, the financial impacts to that, but also as the country may finally be taking a long overdue step to really address racial equity. Um, when you look at those, clearly many of your recommendations are uh, timely, uh, more timely than ever. Um, so thanks for, for the work and the clear recommendations that you outlined. Um, thanks to Joyce uh, Foundation for funding the report itself and the University of Michigan Flint, Chancellor Dutta and Paula Nast and David Moreau at the EDA Center for putting this webinar together. 
we all have a, a long history together. The CS Mott Foundation um, has been a consistent supporter of Brookings since they founded the Metropolitan Program there in 2004. So clearly we've been long been enthusiastic about your research and we like to see it hitting the ground um, in our region and in our, not just our state, but in our entire region. And for the University of Michigan Flint, we've um, really been partners and been there since the idea stage. Um, as I read the report, I was naturally drawn to reflect on, on that history and our history and what it shows about the importance of regional public universities. Our founder, Charles Stewart Mott, and his son, Harding Mott, were both uh, early champions and major supporters starting in the 1940s of the concept of developing high quality regional university in Flint. In a town that was built on labor and factory work, they knew that higher education prospects for many people would, be, uh, would need flexibility. Um, they knew that some people would be income constrained. They knew that some would have complicated uh, family and other obligations. And they also knew that some perhaps just weren't keen on going away to a far off campus. Um, so they knew the importance of it for its educational um, service in a community, but they also knew that the presence of a regional university would provide benefits far beyond the classroom walls. And your report really reinforces all of that and that it's still true today as it was back in those early days. And in fact, is shared by many other communities and institutions across the region. And we all know the world has changed um, since those early days, but as your remarks demonstrated, those principles apply. Um, and I think they probably resonate uh, with others and the report's gonna help um, hopefully all 69 of the regional public universities um, that you identify in the report in our region to stay on course for the continued impact that they have long, long had in our communities. So as I was listening to you, I was reflecting that I'm not an academic and I'm not a university administrator, which um, means that I see this report through the lens of a community partner um, working in philanthropy and a partner with a regional public university with all the work that we do with U of M Flint. And in the Flint area, we unfortunately see the impacts of intergenerational poverty. Uh, we see severe economic distress and racial disparities. Our community, and probably like a lot of the others, the folks that are on this webinar have struggled to find traction um, with the restructuring of the global economy over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Flint once had a per capita income among the highest in the nation. It was the envy of the world with its manufacturing might. Um, but the world changed and communities like Flint are still working to recover and find footing in the new economy. And in this context, places like University of Michigan Flint and the other 69 um, similar universities across the region um, are just vital assets. Uh, and as your report shows, so important. Um, they educate students uh, for the current and future economy. They provide community-based data and research. They engage with the community. I know that's a priority uh, here in Flint for the university to be an engaged university. Um, and they form important institutes that uh, um, lead on issues like the EDA Center does on economic development in our region. So those are just a few of the impacts that an external partner like me see and that the report helps highlight as fundamentally important aspects of protecting, preserving, and growing the regional um, public universities in our region. As you said at the outset, regional universities promote educational access and strive to meet the needs of their communities. In our case, we're able to partner not only with the regional university here in our hometown, but as a national funder, we also find that these institutions are some of the best uh, situated partners in a community. So when we're working in other parts of the country on a wide range of uh, specific topics that we fund nationally, we know the power of these institutions and often find them to be um, really good partners. So promoting the partnership and the community engagement of these universities beyond um, the, the specific educational um, outcomes are, are really important and I'm glad that the report highlights that. Um, let me close by saying that the report um, really has wonderful highlights and recommendations, but true to Brookings traditional approach, you also highlight some serious challenges and some of the threats and that's really important, um, especially in this current context to look at and the ones that stood out to me in your report are funding um, and the pending demographic shifts uh, in our state and in our region are some of the most acute and concerning and ones that we as a funding partner are going to be um, really looking at and thinking how do we help address those. Um, your report shows that all of us in the Great Lakes states have a lot to be proud of, but we also have a lot to be concerned about as we face a more uncertain future together. And we have a wonderful panel um, lined up next to delve deeper into that, into all those issues, and to hear from actual experts in the field who work um, day in and day out with regional public universities. And so I am pleased um, to introduce a panel that will take us to our next session. Um, we will be moderated by Samir Gadkari, 
uh, from the Joyce Foundation in Chicago, who was the funder of this um, specific report. Um, he'll be joined by uh, Provost Leslie Roundtree from the Chicago State University and Provost Carrie Schuling from Northern Michigan University and Commissioner Dennis Olson from the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. So welcome all of you and thank you. And Samir, I uh, turn the Zoom over to you. Thank you, Neil. And uh, my thanks to the University of Michigan Flint uh, and the Mott Foundation for their support of this work and to the uh, Brookings Institution for the great work that you've done and particularly Rob and Mark. Um, I wanted to offer a couple of quick comments as context for this panel. And I wanted to start with the fact that, uh, and this is no surprise, I think, to most of you, but at the same time that over the past couple of decades that higher education and a bachelor's degree have become increasingly important in the labor market, increasingly a prerequisite for getting to a stable job with family sustaining wages, we've actually seen widening race and income-based gaps in who has that college degree. Uh, in 1990, uh, white young adults were 13 percentage points more likely than black young adults to uh, have a BA and 18 percentage points more likely than Latino students uh, to have a BA degree. Those gaps are actually now wider. It's 19 points for black uh, young adults and, and 24 points for Latinx young adults. Uh, there's a 48 percentage point gap between wealthy and poor individuals in terms of who has a bachelor's degree. And I think it raises the question of the degree to which higher education um, needs to change in order to support racial equity and economic mobility uh, instead of actually widening some of these gaps. Um, that's why the Joyce Foundation is so interested in public regional universities. We seek to advance uh, economic mobility and racial equity in the Great Lakes region uh, through state and federal policy. And uh, in the higher education arena, we think that the public regional universities are a crucial part of that puzzle. Um, we, as Mark mentioned earlier, you, we hear so much about Ivy League schools, which are a fraction of a percent of higher education. We hear a great deal about public flagship universities, uh, which maybe are, have about 10% of overall all enrollments. But we hear far less about public regional universities, which have about a third of overall enrollments in our higher education system. Um, they have been facing over the past several years a, a challenging context. And we know that uh, on the one hand, they could be the key to a more equitable future for our region, for our nation. But on the other hand, if left to languish, could uh, be a vehicle by which we actually exacerbate some of our existing gaps in our society. And so I'm really excited to talk to a distinguished panel with you today. Um, uh, one thing before we get into this, I want to remind you that uh, you can ask questions at any time in the Q&A um, uh, function of the Zoom, and we'll be collating those as we go along. Let me start, uh, Dr. Schuling, uh, with you, and I would wondered whether you could say a couple words about Northern Michigan University uh, and its role in the community uh, there around Marquette, as well as what does the college going landscape look like for students around you? Um, Northern Michigan University is located in Marquette, which is in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We're very rural. We represent 3% of the population of the state of Michigan and a third of the land mass. So you can picture that. Um, our, we are, we're very entwined with our community. We're um, one of the three largest employers. The other employers are the mines and the hospital. Um, our president often says, communities support universities that support communities. And we are a Carnegie um, engaged community. Um, so um, as far as programs and what we offer, we offer a wide range. We um, offer everything from certificate level, um, mini masters programs through to the doctorate level. We have one applied doctorate, applied practice. That's the uh, DNP, Doctorate of Nursing Practice. Much like you say, we started as a normal school, so we have a wonderful school of education, nursing, and that kind of thing, but we also go through the landscape. We want to keep um, our population here and have viable uh, jobs, so uh, cybersecurity has become increasingly important, and um, we've enlarged in that type of program as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. 
And Marquette is lovely for those of you who haven't been there. Hopefully, we'll be, I'll be able to travel there again soon. Uh, Dr. Roundtree, could you say a couple words about similarly uh, your institution and the role that it plays in its community um, uh, in Chicago? Thank you. Uh, Chicago State University is a uh, comprehensive master's tool institution located on the far south side of Chicago, actually in a residential community. And it's actually sitting in one of the most um, impoverished communities in the Chicago land area. So we are a major employer as well as a support through our programs to many of the um, businesses such as hospitals and other businesses in the area. Uh, Chicago State University is Illinois' only um, predominantly black institution, which means 70% of our population is African American. Um, and we have a very high uh, number of Illinois residents. 91% of our students are Illinois residents. So we are um, highly connected to the community that we serve. We also, as um, has been pointed out, we are the kind, we started as a normal school as well. So we have education, but also healthcare, pharmacy, and a strong STEM program that has actually enriched the number of graduates moving on into areas that are often underrepresented. But I think the other thing that's really nice about our campus, we have 161 acres. Um, and our campus serves as a community uh, place where many of the uh, children come to learn to swim. Um, they take camps here, as well as we convene community uh, education programs as well. So we are a, a strong member of the community here on the South Side. Thank you. Commissioner Olson, let me turn to you next. And um, just to offer a little bit of context, uh, Commissioner Olson was chosen by Governor Walls to head higher education in the state of Minnesota. I know that you've made addressing uh, gaps in attainment rates and racial equity um, one of the kind of highest priorities for your administration. Could you say a couple words about how do, how do regional public universities in Minnesota play into that goal and what's the role that you see for them at the state level? Sure, thank you, Samir, and thanks for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, before I jump into that, just a real quick uh, landscape overview of Minnesota's higher ed uh, environment overall, really healthy and, and vibrant environment. Uh, we have 37 colleges and universities within the Minnesota State uh, colleges and university system spanning 54 campuses. Uh, the University of Minnesota system, of course, has uh, the flagship University of Minnesota Twin Cities, but also four uh, regional campuses of the University of Minnesota system. And, you know, we have nearly 20 long established private nonprofit colleges throughout the state, but you know, really the, the anchor are 10 regional public universities here in Minnesota. Uh, they represent and, and sit in nearly every corner of the state. You know, we have seven institutions that are part of the Minnesota state system, uh, three University of Minnesota regional campuses, and nine out of those 10 are in our smaller urban communities as well as uh, rural communities and greater Minnesota communities outside of metropolitan uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, much like the, the first two panelists mentioned, the, the regional public universities are critical to their individual regional economies, uh, and of course the state's economy overall, um, and they provide critical options for students who typically want to stay in the region, stay in their own region, stay home, stay close to home. Uh, these are perfect options for students in, in rural and greater Minnesota, and uh, you know, overall throughout the throughout the regional public universities, we have nearly 100,000 total students that are enrolled uh, in our regional public universities. Um, as far as a, a attainment goal, statewide attainment goal, just to help everybody understand uh, Minnesota a little bit, uh, Minnesota has a goal, uh, much like a majority of our states in the nation, um, that 70% of Minnesota adults age 25 to 44 
will have attained some uh, sort of credential by the year 2025. And uh, that 70% goal is lofty. It's one of the loftiest attainment goals, statewide attainment goals in the nation. Um, and we're currently at 62.2%. And, you know, we've been making incremental uh, progress, incremental increases since the goal was set by the legislature um, in 2015. But we know that, uh, you know, our, our regional public universities are playing a critical role there um, because of the students they serve. Uh, you know, we heard in the overview that uh, our regional public universities, not only in the Great Lakes region, but uh, particularly Minnesota, serve a majority of our black students in the state, serve a majority of our American Indian students in the state. And that's where some of our largest gaps lie. You know, I, I give you that overall number for Minnesota, it's 62.2% attainment um, to show that we have one of the, the highest attainment rates in the nation. But when you start to peel back the layers of the onion a little bit and disaggregate the data, you see that we have some of the largest gaps in the nation as well. Um, our American Indian students, for instance, are currently sitting at 28% statewide attainment, but nearly half of those um, live at the certificate level. And uh, that's, that's up, that 28% is up from 21% overall attainment for American Indian students. And, you know, similarly for Latinx, uh, growth from 23% to uh, just over 28%. For our Black students in Minnesota, 34% to now just over 37%. So you can see incremental increases um, and some success to celebrate, but, you know, with a sometimes 30, 40, even 50 point gap between our American Indian students and students of color and our white students, we know that we have one of the largest gaps in the nation too. So we've been you know, partnering really closely with regional public universities. We launched a, a listening session tour and strategy session, session tour last year, uh, partnering specifically with our regional publics to talk about attainment. You know, we know that to reach our goal, we need about 121,000 credentials to get to that 70% statewide goal. But to get there equitably, we know that over 85,000 of those credentials need to be awarded to students of color and American Indian students across the state. And we see our regional public use as critical partners to that uh, based on the students that they serve in, our, in the communities they serve. Thank you, Commissioner Olson. Dr. Schuling, let me, turn, let me use that to pivot to you. And can you say a couple words about how uh, Northern Michigan University thinks about serving uh, Native American populations and working with tribal nations near you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, um, one of the uh, things that I'm probably um, very, very excited, we do have a, a Center for Native American Studies. Last year, we separated that and um, we're actually searching for a director of that center um, so that because before that, the director was also a department head because we offer a major in uh, Native American Studies. And we felt that by having a director that would free that person up to do more collaborating um, with um, the other um, uh, Native American uh, potential students and Native American uh, individuals who um, occupy not only in the UP, but across the state and, and elsewhere. Really, um, we want to get some national attention to that program. We're very proud of it. One of the things that happened last year that um, we were quite excited about is we applied for a Native American Heritage Fund grant. We have um, a, a instructor, Judd Sojourn, who um, is, he teaches the um, Ashnavi Moen language, but he is also knowledgeable about the symbols and um, one of the few people who can teach about the, the symbols. And um, what we found is that that language was getting lost because we didn't have people who um, knew it or um, knew how to speak it or to teach it. And um, we were thrilled to get support from the Native American Heritage Fund. And so we not only teach that to our graduate students, but we're also teaching it in the K-12 schools and that's housed within our um, School of Education. So we're, we're very proud of that and um, embracing that. Um, you know, Governor Whitmer, we're very lucky to have a governor who has made as one of her campaign promises to fully fund the tuition waiver for Native American students. So um, we're, we're very excited about that, but um, also feel very supported by that. Um, yeah, 
So I think that answers your question. It does, thank you. Um, and Dr. Roundtree, we've seen a much needed attention to the persistent gaps, unfortunately, that, are, uh, that black individuals face in our country and the systemic racism that we see in our society. Can you say a few words about um, what Chicago State is doing um, to serve black students? And also say a few words about if, if you look across the state of Illinois, what it would take for our state to produce more equitable outcomes in higher education. Well, if I had all of the answers for that, we'd be great. But I think one of the places to start is in some of the funding formulas in which we approach um, education. We are very pleased with our current uh, governor and his support for the uh, higher education, and we've had a stable budget for two years. But you may have noticed, or many of the participants may have noticed, Illinois' giant drop in that chart where we had no funding for almost two years in higher education. But our approach to funding for higher education is really one of equal funding. So all institutions, no matter the size or who they serve, receive the same amount of funding, a percentage typically each year, but it does not take in consideration what's the difference between the missions and the uh, focus of the institutions, such as Chicago State. We currently are graduating, we're the fourth, uh, number four in graduating African American students in the state. However, our size is about uh, 10 times smaller than all of the institutions that precede us. So what we've done is we really have taken on this as our key focus on equity and so that we can make sure that students feel like there is a place for them in the state of Illinois. Um, one of our programs that we are kicking off this year is um, what we're calling our Cougar Commitment in which we are going to continue to provide the necessary support services that address students who come from backgrounds that have multiple responsibilities. Um, the average age of our student is 30 years old and 89% of them are Pell recipients. So they're coming to us with other responsibilities on top of attempting to try to get an education. Um, and in this Cougar commitment, we're sponsoring what we're calling the RISE Academy. Um, we've learned at the RISE Academy that if we can give a early and slower start, it also supports students to make that adjustment because many of our students have uh, stopped out of school or taken a break to have a child or something. And so it's that slower start. And that's going to come with full tuition and books and fees, as well as, of course, the, tech, the digital divide. We're going to have to provide the computers and the hotspots because COVID showed us the digital divide was wider than ever um, this year. Thank you. Let me turn then to the finances for a minute. And of course, uh, unfortunately, given the COVID-19 pandemic and its likely effects on state revenue, absent federal support, uh, regional public universities will be looking at pretty uh, significant budget cuts. Um, can you say a few words about how those budget cuts impact an institution? And maybe, we'll, just to put a finer point on it, over the last couple of decades, higher education has become increasingly driven by tuition and fees. And I think it was Rob who noted earlier that you don't have as much of an ability in your institutions to draw wealthy out of state students who can pay high tuition levels. So can you say a few words about what are the trade-offs that you face uh, between access and affordability in public regional universities? And uh, maybe we could just ask each of the panelists to reflect a little bit on that. Maybe Commissioner Olson, do you wanna start us off there? Yeah, sure, not a problem. Uh, you know, there's certainly potential for cuts to systems and campuses. You know, I think we've we've seen that forecasted in 
in all of our states. Um, you know, a couple of, of our regional public universities, um, St. Cloud State University, for instance, and uh, Winona State University in Minnesota here, um, were even working through and had announced cuts uh, prior to COVID-19. Um, and those were primarily due to uh, projected declining enrollment and uh, continued declining enrollment and uh, reliance on tuition and fees. Um, you know, as, as part of that, they had announced significant faculty retrenchments and uh, program cuts to social sciences and really whole degree programs and majors. Um, what was, I think, most concerning to, to me and uh, to us as a statewide agency uh, were the potential cuts to, to campus services like library services. Um, you know, and we know as, as a COVID pandemic has shown us, uh, students did not have equitable access to technology uh, to support distance learning and alternate course delivery. Um, you know, those library services for, or for computer access and for internet access and subscription access were absolutely critical, um, especially for students of color and for students with greater financial needs. And of course, uh, students in, in rural areas, students in greater Minnesota where broadband access and internet access and Wi-Fi access isn't always uh, either reliable or even available. So, you know, I've, I've spent some time with faculty and um, they've expressed, of course, um, concern with, with these cuts overall, but really disproportionate cuts to faculty of color as well. Um, and supports positions for students of color and American Indian students. And, you know, it, at the state level, uh, we, we oversee, our agency oversees the administration of need-based financial aid and our systems and campuses have, have worked really hard to, during the pandemic here, you know, freeze tuition as much as possible, either for this upcoming fall semester or even for the upcoming year. Um, but if they experience cuts uh, during the next biennium, along with potential cuts to, to financial aid to students who need it the most, um, our students will essentially be hit twice. Uh, they'll be hit with tuition hikes as well as uh, reduced financial aid awards. And, you know, although it, it may be necessary or seem as though it may be necessary, you know, now is not the time to um, entertain any budget cuts or disinvestment. Um, you know, we've, we've come really close here in Minnesota, as we saw in the earlier data, um, to bringing state support back to pre-recession levels. But, um, you know, students are unfortunately now shouldering a greater share of, of the cost. And institutions, I think, historically coming out of the last recession had the tuition lever to pull. And I don't think we have that lever to pull anymore. Uh, we don't have that option. I think here in Minnesota, and I'm sure uh, folks in other states would agree too, that we're at our ceiling. We're at our absolute maximum ceiling with tuition. Um, here in the States, we have to focus on increased investments to keep our institution and of course our students healthy. Dr. Schilling, Dr. Andre, anything you'd like to add? I would just agree that it, you, we cannot keep raising tuition as a way to um, ensure that the institutions can be stable because Again, then we eliminate the access for the students who really most need it. So um, again, looking for other diversifications of revenue uh, has become significant for us as we're trying to ensure that we still meet the mission and, and provide the access. I absolutely agree with you. Um, you know, Central is always holding students harmless um, as much as possible. And we have the second lowest tuition in the state. Um, we try to maintain that. Um, we're absolutely looking at budget cuts. We're doing things um, in an order of things like buyouts, uh, furloughs, all administrators have taken a, a cut. Um, you know, COVID has certainly had a, a very negative impact in that respect on trying to predict what our revenue is. You know, the state um, has a budget shortfall of $6.2 billion that is projected over the next 15 months or so. And our governor is working very hard at the federal level to exhaust any areas uh, where we might get help from the federal government. But because of that, she is not making any decisions on cuts to higher ed. And um, so we probably won't know our budget until next October. And that makes um, budget decisions for us very, very difficult. 
um, obviously one of the things that um, has helped a great deal is our foundation um, and um, raising you know funds for scholarships that help support our students and um, we're very fortunate to have a strong foundation and um, we're very lucky that we have some solid supports, you know, looking at our students and things that will help them stay in school. Um, a variety of ways that the university too um, has looked at, you know, you have, when you have students who come, you know, we're a, we're a first gen institution uh, and a lot of our students come, you know, from families that, you know, have unemployment issues and um, trying to stay in school can be very, very difficult and students end up dropping out for a variety of reasons, but oftentimes it might mean I can't get my car fixed, so I have to dry, you know, drop out of school. So um, our um, Dean of Students and Financial Office um, worked very closely to have what we call finish grants. You know, sometimes it's as much as $1,000 that will keep a student in school and let them graduate. Um, so let's... Um... Let's say, link that back to what Mark was saying earlier. And uh, as you know, the Brookings team at the Metropolitan Policy Program has written extensively about regional economic divergence, the tendency in our economy for uh, a few large metro areas to have runaway growth relative to everyone else. Um, there's a great concern about the, the south side of Chicago. There's a great concern about places like Northern Michigan getting left behind. And I think, Dr. Schulin, can you put a finer point on this? I think you said at the beginning in your opening remarks that you were one of the biggest employers in your region, and now you're talking about furloughs and uh, pay cuts. Can and you... what, the, in, what I would like to explain with those is that's, that's still keeping people employed. So if they're, we're not um, at the point where we're laying people off or letting people go. Indeed, it's kind of like we're pulling together to keep the majority of our people employed. Um, that's, that's the goal of the president and our board. So things like furloughs, um, you know, sometimes you can tolerate that impact a lot more than you could the loss of a job. Um, some of the um, people that took furloughs over the summer were able to, um, I would say a lot of them were able to get unemployment support and then they'll be called back as we reopen in the fall which is what we're planning on doing, um, you know, but over and over again, our president and our board say we want to keep as many people employed as possible. And I think they've been very careful and very thoughtful um, about how they're doing that. I don't know if that answers your question. Sure, that's helpful. Um, let me pivot a little bit. We've had a couple questions about the workforce mission of regional public universities. Maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Roundtree. Couldn't help but notice in my preparation that both you, Dr. Rountree, and you, Dr. Schuling, were previously deans of health sciences. And we're oftentimes thinking about things like nursing shortages and how do we get enough nurses um, to, to work in our hospitals. Uh, and of course, we are all thinking about the healthcare sector right now. Could you maybe say a few words about um, who are the healthcare graduates from your respective universities and what's the labor market niche that they're filling? Well, we have a College of Health Science as well as a College of Pharmacy. Um, in our health science program, we have nursing, public health, occupational therapy, and health information management. And we are probably, between both of our colleges, the number one producers in our state of diverse healthcare providers. So um, what's unique about, I think, our students and our graduates, are they are the ones who will go into the medically underserved communities and service their communities. So many of our graduates work in our nearby hospitals who are so underserved, especially during this most recent crisis. So we feel that there's gonna be a growing need. We're looking at how to assist that. We have over the past, um, couple of years also started a lot of certificates in order to help people to start that workforce journey. It's hard to commit to a four-year degree in nursing when you're still trying to determine how to feed your family, but we have a CNA program where we can get you employed and support from your employer to go back to school and to continue. So we've been really looking at um, 
uh, steps in order to ensure that students can come in and start their education and not be withdrawn because of just typical financial issues. I wonder if this is a good moment to get you to talk for a minute about the contact tracing program that you recently started. Yes, <laughs> that was pretty quick. Yeah, that was a, again a need. We were looking at the area um, and the demand on the south side for contact tracing, pulled our public health as well as our sociology and um, African American history and Latino res uh, history people together to really build a culturally sensitive program that would quickly help address the city's need as the city has identified that it has probably close to a need for a thousand workers. Um, it actually started this past last Monday. Um, it's a three-week online program and um, we've had great um, representation from people all over the city who are interested and we think this is a stepping stone because um, this is an introduction to public health. Maybe they want to move on to a community health degree or a master's in public health. So we find this is an exciting opportunity. Dr. Schilling, do you want to say a few words about this? Sure. Um, we also have very strong um, health-related programs, clinical sciences and nursing. The ones that you would um, anticipate, we have a really great speech, language, and hearing um, program and we also have um, the only clinic in the um, it's a it's a program it's called the Bayer Clinic behavioral I won't remember all the acronym but it treats um, uh, children who are um, not just on the autism spectrum but um, children who have um, difficulty with um, socialization and and some of those behaviors and it's the only one in the Upper Peninsula um, so um, and that they've done just tremendous amount of outreach with that um, along with that we um, also have started a testing course we're complementing your tracing course and um, that uh, is admitting students primarily from the sciences and the health related programs because we're going to be doing mass testing when our students return to campus this fall and who better to help than students with a kind of public health health related science background um, and again our foundation um, was very helpful um, in finding scholarships for a number of students who will be entering that program and then they will have that testing expertise and be able to help us with that um, we also had a number um, we have um, I believe it's 12 COVID courses, some, something around COVID, uh, the nature of the virus, what the testing means, um, you know, what is fake news out there on the internet. It's like a series of one hour courses and we're offering um, that free to the community, but it's taught by the experts within our university. Um, so hopefully to um, ground people in the education of what's really going on. Um, one of those courses is for parents and kids and you know you don't want your children to be afraid for the rest of their life to you know play with one another or socialize so how to how to work through that um, and um, the one that got the most interest is on um, Native American and decolonization of food and um, you know um, that's been very very popular and was um, written up in our in our mining journal paper so um, we try to cover the ground with that. Um, sounds like an interesting course. I wish I could sign up for it. Well, there's but, a whole uh, bunch and it's free. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Olson, could you say a few words? You mentioned Greater Minnesota earlier, and maybe could you say a few words about the, the workforce needs that you see in Greater Minnesota and uh, having enough teachers and nurses and uh, the regional public universities? How do you bring all these things together in this kind of context of uh, maybe not having quite enough money at the state level. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, I, I appreciated the comments about uh, the health careers. That's a critically important area and, uh, um, and piece that our regional public universities fulfill here in Minnesota as well. Um, I did want to talk about the, the education side of things. You mentioned teachers and, um, you know, here in Minnesota, one of the uh, priorities of the governor and lieutenant governor has been to 
uh, build on the work of previous administrations, but really make it a priority right now to uh, grow and increase the number of teachers of color and American Indian teachers um, in our E-12 system or in our K-12 system here in the state. And our regional public universities have been critical partners in that work uh, with their schools of education. Um, and actually uh, a tie back to my previous work prior to uh, joining the Office of Higher Education, I was the executive director of our Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, our liaison with our 11 tribal nations and state government. And then prior to that was the uh, director of Indian education at the Minnesota Department of Education and had um, an opportunity on the K-12 side to work closely with our regional public universities and, and higher ed partners to establish programs to increase uh, teachers of color and American Indian teachers. And in particular, I oversaw our Minnesota Indian teacher training program, and that partners uh, high need school districts across the state with regional public uh, university schools of education uh, to provide uh, pathways for students to become teachers uh, primarily uh, in those areas serving our, our tribal nations or that share a geographic proximity to our tribal nations. Um, and so, you know, we have three of our, our public universities that uh, continue to play that role and uh, are, are critical partners in that work. And so as we look at, um, at state investments and, you know, potential uh, opportunities for that, we're, we're excited to, to know that our public universities are going to be there uh, to always, always provide that that teacher workforce that's so needed in, in not only in our, our metropolitan areas, but in particular in greater Minnesota, and especially in those areas that serve uh, our American Indian students in the state. Um, let me then turn to a question that we'd, we'd gotten earlier around online education and online higher education. One of the things that we, um, we certainly see interest in as a result of the COVID public health shutdowns is, is online higher ed. Now, of course, there's some data um, suggesting that, uh, well, I guess, let me just ask you to reflect a little bit on the role of public regional universities versus online providers of higher education and how we might see them um, uh, in, in the vein of providing equitable outcomes for students. Yeah, I'll take that first um, and just say that, you know, we know how important being on campus is for the students that our regional public universities serve. Uh, it was mentioned a couple times earlier that, you know, not only students are there for the academic experience, but they're for the support that that is needed too. Uh, these uh, universities are oftentimes serving uh, first generation students, are serving adult students, that have stopped out or dropped out for one reason or another and are now returning uh, to complete their education, but oftentimes have childcare uh, needs, transportation needs, housing needs, other emergency assistance needs, and uh, being on campus and, and having those, um, those services available to them, um, as well as, as the relationships needed to help uh, broker how those services are, are offered and deployed um, are critically important. And so, you know, it's, it's a concern that, that students meeting wholly and fully distance, um, you know, may interrupt and disrupt some of those other needs, those wraparound service needs that our students have come to, to expect and rely on. And so, you know, our hope is that um, if we're looking at, at long-term distance education or partial uh, alternate delivery of courses that, you know, we also consider, um, alternate ways to, de to deploy those resources and make sure that they get to the students so our students can uh, continue to uh, be provided with the, with the services that they require and need. I think the sudden shift of the COVID really uh, highlighted for us the, the disparity uh, among many of our students in terms of the technology Many of them may have had a computer at home, but when you also have your three children at home who are supposed to also be in school online at the same time, one computer does not do it for a family of four. Um, also, we found that the students, um, as Dennis mentioned, really it's the connection and the mentoring 
and the relationships that they're able to get through the other support systems that have really um, strengthened their uh, grit to stay with it during these times. So we, um, we did a survey and, and the students found it tolerable, but it was not the, the mechanism of choice. So while many people think, oh, maybe now all of higher ed can move to online, I don't think they're listening to the people who've experienced the forced nature of this situation. So as we're planning for the fall, we're really looking at some hybrid opportunity that would allow us to still allow students to come to campus, but also keep them safe. We have a global campus, so we do offer a um, variety of programs that are online. Um, many of our programs are hybrid. Um, we, it's a very delicate balance. Um, one of the things about Northern, we had a provost who had um, great vision uh, several years ago, and um, so we partnered with Lenovo, and all of our students who attend here have a laptop. So that's why we're known as the Laptop University. Um, and then, um, of course, was finding the internet because of our great expanse of land, we found out that um, there were parents who were taking their kids to the nearest McDonald's so they could get internet because they couldn't get it where they lived. And um, so from that came something called the Educational Access Network, which um, you know um, we've worked very hard to establish so we have network hotspots throughout the UP so that some um, people living in some of the far-flung cities, um, they no longer have to go to McDonald's. They can actually get it in their own home and it's uh, much less expensive um, in, um, for the for the family and uh, they have to take one course and I think it's $35 or something like that so that has really helped a lot um, but I would tell you um, having I also have a significant background in online learning you know there's a big difference between a student who learns on ground and a student who learns well uh, online and um, you know, you need to help students kind of sort that out. It used to be people would assume that if it's online, it was easier, which is not the case. It's certainly not easier to teach online, um, as anybody who's taught online knows. Um, faculty here who teach online have to go through a very rigorous um, course and um, quality matters and be approved. And so we have a series of steps. Um, but we're primarily a residential campus, and that's why our students come here. Um, so for the switch for us to go online, yep, we did it, and I think overall we did a pretty good job. But uh, the majority of our students who came here want to be on campus. Um, when you do have online students, how you work with them and how you mentor them can be very different. But the need is the same, I think, for both students. They need support, they need mentoring, and um, they need to be able to have access to all of the kinds of materials. Um, so it works both ways. Thank you. And I think that Northern Michigan has a visionary provost now. Um, but let me, uh, let me turn to something, uh, and now I guess we're reaching, we only have a few minutes left, so I'll turn to something that's come up in the questions, and I'll ask you the question directly, although I imagine, uh, uh, you'll be thoughtful about how you answer it so you don't get yourself into trouble. I think, um, you know, oftentimes flagship universities have a tendency to perhaps uh, dominate the discussion, or at least there's a perception that they dominate the discussion of, um, of public policy in higher education uh, in the state legislatures. And I'm just wondering, how do you think about that or navigate that in your states? How do you make sure that public regional universities get their due in the legislative process? Well, I, I can speak for my own state. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, working together across the boundaries. Um, certainly, I see that in the Upper Peninsula where, um, you know, our representatives um, work very much together uh, more often than not. And I think that that's what allows their voices to be heard when we need them, we need Lansing to listen, so. Yeah, I'll just jump in and say that uh, that may have been the case historically in Minnesota, uh, but I do know now that our uh, leadership is, has been incredible in working together and coming to shared priorities. Um, the new president of the University of Minnesota system, Dr. Joan Gable, 
as well as our Chancellor of Minnesota State College and University System, Dr. Devinder Mahaltra, um, have committed to work together and have actually come to our state legislature and addressed the uh, higher education committees uh, jointly and oftentimes speak with one voice, although they have um, at times very different missions and uh, reasons for, for requesting uh, funding that they do. They're also uh, sharing quite a bit of uh, vision and uh, sharing quite a bit of resource requests too. So uh, it, I'm happy to see that. And I think that just lends itself to, you know, the need for, uh, for folks to be working together, especially during uh, times of crisis like this. I would just add that um, one of the opportunities from this pandemic has been the collaborative nature. And I think that everyone realizes that we're stronger together. However, um, I think it, it's critical for the regionals to continue to um, stand tall and voice some of the issues that may be overlooked when we're involved in so many decisions at the same time, such as issues of equity. So um, I think it, the conversation is much richer now than it's been in a, for a while. And so I think it's important that everyone continue this process and not let it just kind of drift away once we find out what post-pandemic America looks like. Well stated, I agree. Well, I just want to thank our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Roundtree. Thank you, Dr. Schuling. Thank you, Commissioner Olson, for taking a few minutes to talk to us today about the role that regional public universities play uh, in your communities and in your state. Um, and I want to turn it back over to Mark Murrow from the Brookings Institution to close us out. Thanks, Samir, and, and uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, so it does, uh, unfortunately, fall to me to uh, close out this great session. I wish it could go on. With that said, I, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you speakers, attendees, universities, philanthropies, uh, for participating in what I thought was an extremely uh, focused, concentrated, challenging, even hopeful discussion. Uh, uh, I feel even more uh, now than I did before the, uh, the, the event that these institutions you know, really are right in the middle of everything happening in, in the country right now. COVID-related economic crisis, issues of social inclusion and racial equity, the ongoing racial, uh, the regional divides that have been spreading and may spread more. Uh, so I suspect many of you feel like I do uh, concern uh, about the burdens weighing on these institutions that are right there in the breach but also uh, a lot of, uh, I think, relief uh, that these institutions are there on the front lines in so many stressed communities, working out solutions of inclusion, uh, economically, racially, and regionally, really, trying to hold uh, uh, communities together. So on that note, you know, please uh, know our appreciation to all of you for joining us and have a good afternoon. Um, thanks so much. Take care.